Praise the Lord. Turn around, just wave to each other. God bless you. It's a blessing in the house today. Hallelujah. God is moving. Amen. Hallelujah. Come, Lord, come. Praise God. You are winners because you've made it in today. Every obstacle the enemy has put in your way, you have overcome. You, we are winners. We're victorious. Praise God. I'd like to just welcome my dear, beloved friend, Ben Day. Let's give him a welcome, apostolic welcome. At the end, I might invite him to just share a few words just to acknowledge him. And he'll speak on behalf of the Boxing Fraternal as well. So God bless you. It's lovely to have you here. Your, your beautiful partner, Nerissa, as well. It's lovely always to speak with you and take the journey of life, the, the challenges in life. Praise God. Amen. It's wonderful. Uh, so today, I just want to invite my readers to come up. Praise God. We have an interesting subject today. In fact, we, we're touching upon it because God wants to make us a living sanctuary. He wants to dwell in each one of us, and he wants his presence to be experienced. Praise God. Amen. So I'm just going to just read, I read first read this from the Old Testament. Yeah. Good morning, church. So I'm reading from Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, 11 to 13. I will set my tabernacle among you. My soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be there, you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. I'm reading from. I'm reading from John chapter 14, verse 17. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Verse 23 of the same chapter. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Revelations chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to dine with him, and he with me. Amen. Thank you. Wonderfully read. God bless you. Amen. And God bless you as well. God bless you. We're coming, approaching our, the Passover, our Easter coming up at the end of the month. And um, we're looking forward to invite your friends, family to come and watch the passion. It changes people's life. It, it has an impact on people because it speaks on a personal basis, on a one-to-one. -one. So please invite your friends and families, your neighbors, your work colleagues. It will change their life. There should be a spiritual health warning coming and watching the, the play, the production, because it has a big impact. I'm saying it's not... It's not done in the usual conventional way. That's what's amazing about it. We want to thank the senior pastor for scripting it, preparing it, and organizing it all together, and everyone involved in it, because everyone who leaves the, 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 the production, coming and watching and being a part of it, leaves and thinks that these are professional actors. I pray they're not professional actors, because the old, uh, the old um, word in the Old Testament was hypocrites. It was what they called the actors. So we're not hypocrites. Praise God. Amen. It's real. It's real. Living, really living it real. Before I actually touch upon the word, just to give an announcement from last week when our sports ambassador was here, Ezra the Cannon Taylor, we went over the weekend to Birmingham. He competed in his campaign to become undisputed world champion. So I just want to show you the little reel, the end of the, um, the event, just to show you the film. Can we should put the film? Ladies and gentlemen, here is the official time. Two minutes, 45 seconds of round number four. Our referee in charge, Kevin Parker, stops the contest. Therefore, your winner, by way of technical knockout, still undefeated, and now the Commonwealth Silver Light Heavyweight Champion, Ezra the And we have the picture as well, just a little image with the belt. Praise God. God bless you. That doesn't just happen. In life, doesn't just happen. We have to put effort into... Thank you. 
We, do, we have to put effort in everything we do. His truth is parallel. And in fact, he was going to be here today. I'll give you the picture later. <laughs> I'm sorry, you missed it. Yeah. Uh, we have to put effort in life. If you want to be a winner in life, spiritual winner, overcoming the hurdles, the obstacles, the challenges, adversities of life, you have to put effort. You know, we come to church one day a week to receive spiritual nourishment to help us grow, to come together, to encourage each other. But in order to fight in the arena of where the likes of Ezra Taylor, who moves on, you don't just win because you have to put an effort. It's not one day of the week turning up to a, an event, a meeting. It's every day getting up in spite of the weather, whether it's freezing, whether it's sunshine, whether it's rain, whatever it is, you get up and you persevere. We don't evangelize because it's always sunny. We've been evangelizing the streets of Ed Edmonton and Enfield, these areas, for over 30 years, week in and week out. And we've seen groups come and go. We've seen people come and show the enthusiasm. We're going we're gonna, to uh, win Edmonton. We're going to do this and that. Within a few weeks, you don't see them for dust. It's a bit cold. They don't turn up. Wow. There you go. That's what I'm saying. In the rain and that's what I'm saying. It's being tenacious. It's being going and rising above the obstacles in life. It takes effort. It makes a decision. You've got to make the decision. The decision is in our hands. The outcomes are in our hands. So God bless Ezra. Everyone sends his lo their love to him as well. Thank you. He'll be here hopefully next week to share something. What it means to be to do what we do because it, for me it's connection. They all we connect the dots. Amen. Praise God. So today's message, the, the subject is sanctuary. And what is a sanctuary? It's a place set apart for a holy purpose. And from the very beginning, God wanted to be in relationship with his creation. In fact, the first sanctuary, I would say, was the Garden of Eden. Because that's where God wanted to meet his creation, Adam and Eve. But in the same place where God wants to make it somewhere holy, somewhere sanctified, we can make it defiled. I wish I'm speaking to... I want, I'll show you. I always like using my object lessons. These are two items that serve a similar purpose. They contain something. Yeah, can you see? This is a glass and this is a chalice. This one looks very ornate on the outside. It has, you say, metaphorically, the Chanel lower... Uh, no, the boss, Hugo Boss, yeah? You have all the, sh all the razzmatazz, glitz. And you have this one, just plain, plain Joe. Sorry, if anyone's called Joe, I'm not meaning a person. Okay. <laughs> but they're supposed to serve the same purpose. We're all vessels, uh, instruments, vehicles, that we, we, we can do different types of things. We, we all have shared the human, uh, the human nature What's common is that we're human. But what we have in us determines what comes out of us. I wish I'm speaking so. You know, we say, Lord, make me a living sanctuary. We want God to dwell and inhabit the praises of his people. Yeah, be enthroned in the praises of his people. And so, but from, from beginning to end, to actually come to the process to make that reality, we have to make certain decisions in our lives in relation to association. Yeah? See, the, 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 the proof is, is what's in here determines the value of what's outside. If I put a diamond in this one, and I just put polluted water in this one, which will have the greater value? Mandatory value. If you sense, well, we're using parallels. Truth is parallel. The one which has what's in it, depending on the value of what's in it, determines the value of what's outside. Huh? It's not how you look on the outside for God. It's who's in the inside that truly matters. Yeah? The temple in Jerusalem was set aside apart as a, temp as a permanent place of God's presence. A sanctuary for God to dwell with his people in, in a permanent way. The tabernacle was a sanctuary which was movable, was not permanent. Was moving, it was on a journey, it was a pilgrimage. But the Solomon's temple was a permanent sanctuary where God wanted to dwell continually in, within his people's lives. I wish I'm speaking to someone. And God wants us to, re, re, to actually reflect the permanent, not the thing that's moving around all over the place. Yeah? 
But depending on what's in our hearts will determine who we are in relation to God. Just because God set Jerusalem as his abode, as his center for, for his people, it didn't mean that that center, because he calls it uh, uh, sanctified and calls it holy, that the people will reflect that in their attitude and way of life. Because they turned something that God called holy into a defilement. Take the journey with me, please. So what's in us, what we allow in us, will determine who we are, what we are, and how we act. See, just by coming to church, which is wonderful, and it's a praise the Lord, it's praiseworthy, and I commend everyone for making this effort, because sometimes it's an effort. I went to Birmingham three t- days, there and back, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We had the tournament yesterday. We had the victory, thank God, for Ezra, and we thank God for the opponent's lovely young man by the name of Prince, and so forth. But it's a wonderful occasion. We do it in a good, in a good way, and I still drove back last night praise God. We got back last night in order for myself to be here this morning because I believe God had the message for the church. I could have said, you know what, I'll find that I can have an excuse. But let's be, let's, I want to serve God. I want God to be manifesting with everything we say and do. So praise the Lord. Now, so you can take something which is holy and make it unholy. You can be in a place, but you're not in the place. Just because we're physical doesn't mean we're in the place. Uh, you get that when you get home. What I mean by this, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, they were in a, supposed to be in, in a place. They're supposed to have the labels. They, they're supposed to have all the, all, all the, uh, the decorations, but th- it was an empty place. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice. Now, this is speaking directly to a church. He's knocking at the door of a church or people's lives, but he's outside. We can be a church having God outside of our lives. And depending on the values we have, we make it a sanctuary, an abode, a holy place of God, or we can make it a defiled place. Watch this. I want to qualify these things for you because I want to encourage you to invite God, for God to be present in your lives. Acknowledge his presence in your life and help help you transform yourself to be all that he wants you to be. It's empowering, enriching. It doesn't stop your quality of life. Look, we, we serve the purpose of God, but God permeates everything. For every, there's, in every area of life, God is in the midst of whether you're in films, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're, 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 you're in office, whether you're a cleaner, wherever you are in life, God should be in the midst of that. Praise. And it makes life a lot more joyous and refreshing and exciting and, and, and enjoyable. Praise God. The journey is an adventure. And in, in, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 10, this is what happens with the Lord. He was going toward Jerusalem. We're coming to, 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 the, to the Easter period, the, pa, the Passover. And, and this is the, the time that this, 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 this uh, passage is, is, is taken from. Uh, it, it says, uh, Matthew 21, verse 10 says this. Please follow this message because it will enrich you. It will bless you. It will add quality to your life. It will empower you. Who wants to be empowered in God? I don't want to have knowledge. I want the power of God. It's not what I know. It's who I know. That makes a difference in my life. Helps me navigate the, the contradictions of life, the difficulties of life, the, 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 the unexpected things of life. Helps me go through them and come unscathed on the other end, on the other side. Because I know that we have a spiritual element to life. And I know God is with us all the time. Every breath we take, God is in the midst of everything we say and do. The world doesn't want to acknowledge God, but I want to centralize, I want to celebrate God. Uh, uh, Matthew 21 verse 10 says this, and, and when he had come into Jerusalem, there's a center place, a city where God set his temple, where Solomon builds, builds a temple and adorns it with all the decorations, all the splendor and everything, and God appears there, his kind of glory appears there, and they cannot worship because of the presence of God. The Levitical priests do not worship because God's presence, because when God comes in the house, he takes over. What we say is meaningless. When he comes in, when he shows up, we've got to be still and know that he's God. All the city was moved saying, who is this? Praise God. When God enters the city of your life, people will marvel around you saying, what's going on here? There's a difference in that person's life. Something's changed in that person's life. There's power. There's something going on. I can't, I can't explain it. I cannot describe it. I, don't, I cannot articulate it. But I know something's different. You know, Peter, how they, he used to, you know, something different about his attitude. Because God has arrived in the city of his life. 
praise the Lord. But what is he going to find in that city of our lives? Is he going to be received? Are we going to be receptive like he stands on the door and knocks? Are we going to open for him to enter and make his abode with us? What are we going to do? What's the attitude we are going to have? And so he says, verse 11, so the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee, verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God. Now, what this is, see, it defines itself, it explains itself. He went into the temple of God. He went into the temple of God. We call ourselves Christian by virtue of the fact that you call yourself Christian. Guess what? You are now the temple of God. Wow. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, 16 says this. Do you not know who is he speaking to? The church, the believer. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? Where did Jesus go? To the temple of God. So Paul identifies, defines you and I, if we call ourselves Christians, the temple of God. And he says, and that the spirit of God dwells in you. The spirit of God dwells in you. Yeah? Okay? Okay. Right, let me go back to my passage very quickly. Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God. So you're the temple of God. So by virtue of the fact that you're the temple of God, that's Jesus' home. Jesus is not coming to a stranger's place. He's coming to his home. He has the title deeds. His father has the title deeds of you. He's purchased you with his blood. You belong to God. And when something belongs to an empire, the, 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 the object of, what, of the, what belongs to the empire has the empire's protection. You become the embassy of the empire of God, and you are the house of God, and you are the responsibility of God. A diplomat is the responsibility of its nation, of its country, and it has diplomatic immunity. You get to study that and get to know what that means, diplomatic immunity. You have rights that the normal citizen doesn't have in the country you represent, or you're in to represent your country. And we have rights in this world, hallelujah, that people of this world do not have spiritual rights as we have because we are citizens of heaven. We are seated in the right hand of God the Father in Christ Jesus. I wish I'm speaking. So. Shall I simplify? Shall I go to a 2.4 sermon? Back in the days, Jesus went to the temple, rode a donkey, and, and it... Or do you want me to speak things that relate to us, that you can embrace, leave here, and be empowered? Because you know if God's central in your life by your actions, by your attitude. And if you contradict that, you cannot really fulfill the divine call in your life, and you become a victim and not a victor of circumstances. And you're always complaining about the past, about this, that. But when you're in Christ, you transcend all these things because you're more than a conqueror, because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. When things don't work out the way we want them to, the natural man throws his dummy at the pram and his toys at the pram. The spiritual man rises above it and picks the other guys' dummies and people's from the pram, tries to put, give them back to them. Because you're no longer, you're in the world, but not of the world. Amen. Am I speaking to someone or just? And, and watch this. And, and it says, and it says, then Jesus went to the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and seats of those who sold doves. And we've got to take this as a warning that we can be victims of influences around our lives and we can start behaving in ways that are ungodly in a godly place we can be ungodly just because this was the house of God it didn't mean by it didn't mean by default that everyone's just going to do the right things all the time you might fall off the cart you might fall astray for a time or, or a moment but God is is more than qualified and experienced to bring you back on course and this is what the church is about, helping us come back on course. And there's nothing too big, too great that God cannot deal with if we allow him to do so. If we say, Lord, here I am. Guide me. Lead me. Use me. Protect me. Bless me. Hallelujah. Praise God. And God will do it. God does that. That's what God is, a blesser by nature. Hallelujah. Praise God. He's a restorer by nature. Hallelujah. Whatever challenge you're facing in your life today, I'm telling you, God can deal with it. 
God can turn it around. 180. God can do that. I, I'm speaking from a 37-year experience of serving and walking in God. The fact that I still can stand there is because the, the, the powers that be couldn't overpower me and overtake me. But thank God I give the glory to God. And so he overturns the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves and this and that. And then he goes to verse 13 and he says this. This is the cracks of it here. He says, and he said to them, it is written, my house should be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. The place that's supposed to be holy, if we're not careful, we can, we can let embitterment enter. We can enter, let unforgiveness enter because the embitterment, embitterment and unforgiveness is a thief, steals your joy. You're drinking, you by hating someone and forgiving them, you're drinking poison, thinking it's hurting them, but it's hurting you more than it's hurting the person, the object. And you shouldn't have an object of hate or unforgiveness or embitterness. We need to be transformed. And you take the journey when the Israelites left Egypt and went through the wilderness, they came to a place of Mara, which was bitter waters, and they couldn't drink the water, and they thought they were going to die of thirst. But God's call to, Moses called to God, and God said, There's a reach out, that piece of wood, take it. The Greek word is xilon, and put it into the water. And when he put it into the it became sweet. And that, that, that what he called xilon is the same word used for the tree of life. The xilon, the zoiz, the xilon, it's the, the same word used in Genesis for the tree of life is used for that wood that he reached and took. And when we take the tree of life, the cross of Calvary, and we put it into the, into the water so our bitterness, it makes them sweet and it changes everything. So powerful. So we can be in a place that we, we call holy. We can call it a church on the outside. But sometimes, oftentimes, more abominations happen in places that are called churches and whatever they want to call them than, than in the world sometimes. Jesus made the statement. Daniel said, when you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, that's when Antichrist will start to reign. Because the Antichrist wants to enter the temple of God and make himself God. And Jesus referenced Daniel when he made this statement. And we could read, read um, basically Matthew 24, verse 15. This is what the Lord tells us here. It says this. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever is, let him understand. Which is the holy place? The temple of Jerusalem. What am I speaking about? We have two, we have two uh, instruments here to, you do the same type of thing, contain liquids or anything else you want to put in them. But you see the thing looks ornate, looks lovely on the outside. This just looks plain, but it's what you put in it that makes a difference. So Jerusalem might have been looking like this, but at that time he's saying there's going to be an abomination coming into this that looks holy and, 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 and godly, but sometimes ungodly things happen in places and it's, and it, and it's illusion. It gives you a false perception of what's going on there. And we've got we to let the Lord enter our lives. He changes everything. And my, my call out, my cry out today to the church is call Jesus to restore our hearts. Amen. Let no, no, no roots of bitterness or anything ungodly just uproot it. Be a gardener today. Go in your garden because the weeds grow. Whether you like weeds or not, they grow. I go into my garden, I go into the back of the path of my house. No sooner do we cut them away, the weeds grow, come again, grow again. I don't plan to grow weeds. Do you plan to grow weeds? But they grow. And the same with the heart. You don't plan to grow uh, things that distract you from God, but you have to uproot them. You need the weed killer. And what is the weed killer? The Holy Spirit, the power of God, will kill the weeds of the negativity, the evil defilements of God. Of their devil, I should say. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then he says, verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. So it's in Jerusalem. And when you see that happening with a soul place that is, that is expected to be holy, yeah, you see something unholy taking place. It says, flee to the mountains. And this is a metaphor that Jesus is using here, as well as a physical act. Get out of there as quick as you can. Yeah, do not be a victim of abomination. Get out. Flee to the mountains. Flee to the mountains. What happens on mountains? What well, Moses received the Ten Commandments on the mountains, spoke with God. Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, but it takes effort to get to the mountain. We sometimes procrastinate and become victims of our procrastination. I wish I'm speaking to this. It's a word I don't always like to use. It's a long word, but it means laziness, in other words. 
We become a victim of our laziness. And if your garden is overgrowing, if you don't get up and start pulling out the weeds, you're going to be overgrown with your weeds. They will choke everything else. And that's what happens in life. Things grow in us that we need to uproot. Attitudes, thoughts, conversations, whatever it is, distractions. And we need to let God, the power of the Holy Spirit, start to change us within. And there are different places through the journey of life that we encounter the sanctuary of God. It begins through God connect, God wants to connect with us. From the very beginning, God wanted to make his sanctuary with, with his people. Praise the Lord. And so how does he do this? To restore that, he comes and he changes our surroundings. He wants to change our minds. He's going to change our hearts. He wants to change our, our, the way we speak, the way we behave. But we've got to be consensual in that. God does not force you. God does not tie you with chains and drag you along. He invites you. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Unfortunately, the truth of the matter, sad to say, oftentimes, more than not, people honor God with their mouth, but there's nothing there. Because you only know it's there when the action takes place. When the going gets tough, that's where you know what's there. Yeah? It's in the same way a parallel this with sport. Any sport person, any athletic person. If you're competing in a tournament, the tournament will reveal your, your training regime. Isn't that right, Ben? It's when you get into the ring or when you get into the arena or when you get into the stadium on the day will reveal, has that person trained properly or not trained properly? Amen. See what I'm saying? So, so the thing is this, when we have the challenge, have we prayed? Have we been praying up? Have we been praying? Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, Jesus makes a profound statement. He says this, but you, when you pray, where do you go? Go into your room. Yeah, And when you have shut your door, you don't need an audience to pray. You will come here to celebrate and encourage us, which is a part of the process, because this too is the sanctuary of God. The church is the gathering of believers becomes the sanctuary of God. God is in the midst of his people. When two or three are gathered in his name, where is he? He is in the midst of us, praise God. And we more than qualified to have him here because there's more than two or three. I wish I'm speaking to some. But you don't need, when you're praying your prayer for your own personal journey, you do not need an audience. Don't go to, God bless you, don't go to the th phone all the time and talk about what you, what's been happening, or she said, he said, they said. Forget all that. No one will give you a, a wise counsel, spiritual counsel, if they're talking from the natural man. In fact, they'll make the problem worse, not better. They even make you more angry than bring you peace, because they remind you what a victim you have become. They, might, they remind you what that you, you've been unjustly treated. They remind you all these things and it fuels, it's fuel to make you more angry. But go to the room. And I can tell you, you genuinely go to the room, you come out a different person. Amen. Hallelujah. And he says, shut your door. This is the door. Shut this. We love I try, when I'm off the pool, I don't really like talking too, too much. But I just, I have to do, to just convey the message of God. I shut your door. Pray to your father who is in the secret. Say, pray to your father who is in the secret place. How do, well, if you shut your mouth, how do you pray to your father? In stillness sometimes. Because he says, your father knows what you need before you pray for it. All you need to, the reason we acknowledge and we vocalize it sometimes so we know what we want and hear whether it's a want or a need who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly so whatever we're lacking in life God will provide from his abundance when we put ourselves in the right place God doesn't actually spoil us in a sense. He gives us what we need because it's the best for us. And oftentimes we do, we make a mistake by spoiling people and spoiling our children sometimes because we give them the wrong, we enable them to, to carry on in their, in, their, in their wrong attitude, their selfishness and things like this. And I'm as guilty as everyone else for that. But we take the journey. We learn. And so when you go in the secret place, he rewards us. So this must be the sanctuary here. 
the secret places that you shut this in your secret place. And so what we put in these two different items here will determine the value of them. And don't make assumptions that because one is so all name, it's better, it can do more than the other. Because if you're thirsty in the desert, and this one has no water or has, has contaminated water, and this one has fresh water, which is the one you prefer? The one that's going to quench your thirst. We look on the outside. Someone looks like a priest. Someone looks like a vicar. Someone looks like a, a bishop. I dress in my vest. And I always say to people, don't, don't judge me by my appearance. It's our fruit, our life that reveals who and what we are. And it's the same with everyone here. There's no exceptions. You all have the same responsibility to, to decide what, who and what you are in relation to God. That wh whether you are what you say you are or what people say you are or, or whether you're not. Or whether there's something wrong that you need to get right. And don't despair. Take courage. Because God can make things right. If you've erred in any way, God can restore the years that the locusts have eaten. Praise God. And God's desire, primary desire, I want you to get this in your mind, is not for you to be religious. People often think I'm against religion. I'm not against religion. Religion is trying to find God. Faith and relationship is fighting. Not in, you've actually found him. And you learn to grow and live in him. Praise God. So, so you, need, you need to have that desire. And God's desire, primary desire, is to make his home with you, make you the, his sanctuary, to reflect his love and his presence in the world. But we make choices now. Do I, do I surrender to him or do I want to keep control? Because when you surrender, a, a person who surrenders to God would look completely different if he didn't or she didn't surrender to God. I wish I'm speaking to someone. Your, out, your attitude, your responses, or your reactions are completely different when you're, res when you're surrendering and when you're not surrendering. When you're surrendering, it's all about him. When you're not surrendering, it's all about me. Yeah, come on. And that's why Jesus in Matthew, uh, John chapter 14, verse 17, he, say, he made this statement. This is what Jesus says. The spirit of truth, he says, whom the world cannot receive. Because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And when you let the Holy Spirit take over, your quality of life is transformed. Yeah? For the better, not for the worse. And you will only know it when you get there. Of the time, religion, people look religion or Christian, oh my goodness, I can't do this, I can't do this. No, there's things that we won't do, not that we can't do. You get that when you get home. Things that we, we, not things that we can't, things that we won't do. It's not that we can't do anything. We won't do it because it's damaging something about us and other people around us. Yeah? And we've got to stay faithful to him who called us and be the example that he wants us to be. And it's a quality of life that is wonderful. Praise the Lord. It doesn't diminish you, the joy of life. It increases the joy of life. You're a part of the mechanisms of the world, but not of the world. Watch. And then in 14 verse 23, he says this. It goes on to say this. The same chapter says this. Jesus said to him, if anyone loves me, now the question is, basically, do you love him? Yeah. He will keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. So hold it a second. So in 17, he says the Holy Spirit's going to be in you. And then he says, if you love me, you will keep my word, and if we keep his word, what it says, my father will love you, and we, my father and I, will come to him and make our home with him, meaning you have the power of the Trinity, of the tripartite God, of the Godhead. Some people don't like using the word Trinity. Let's call it Godhead. The Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, want that place, want you to be a sanctuary for them. Praise God. Want you to invite them in and change his everything. Now, what do you have? Let me see. Let's weigh in the balance. Let's last few moments of the message this morning. Let's see what we have in the balance. Let's weigh things up. All right. Religion is what, what you can't do. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Uh, people look down, frown upon religion. You're religious, but you're fanatic. You're freak. This you go in a holy, I'm so humble, I'm, and all this kind of thing. But, yeah. But when you have the relationship, it changes. So what do you have? You can have... Association in the world that promises you everything and delivers nothing. I can tell you that. Yeah? They promise you the world and give you nothing. Or you can have the one who created the world. 
the one. So what do you have in you? You can have the values of the world in you that take you to know. When you have a problem, it's like a flat tire. It won't get you anywhere. You have the problems of the world. The, the world, you can't get anywhere with that. When you have a problem, you're going to find, you call everyone to be your counsellor. You're going to re, re, repeat, regurgitate your, your, your problems to, the, to everyone you see. You're going to re, it's like a trigger, prompt. Everyone's, you know what happened to me yesterday? Bum, bum, bum. Oh, you know what happened to me yesterday? Bum, bum. Can you relate to that? I don't know if you can relate. I might be, everyone you're talking, I'm only telling you this, no one else, and everyone else knows about it. <laughs> don't tell anyone. But next thing I'm going, do you know what happened to Sue? Yeah. I thought I was the only one who knew this. It seems everyone knows it, tabloids. But then you can have the one who can have the answer, the solution, which is God. Now, his response is different to all these responses. And you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what do you have in you if you have the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? You have the power of creation. Amen. Brought things out from nothing into being. Not something that was there that shaped it, but from nothing brought something to being. Well, you didn't have anything. You couldn't find a way forward. And God produced that in, in air from nowhere. Huh? On the cross of Calvary, there was the thief, two thieves, one on one side, one on the other. Jesus had nothing to give physically. He was beaten unrecognizable. Even there's an old writing, an old scripture that says that his mother asked John the evangelist, which one of them is my son? I cannot recognize him. And he said he has nothing. And you want to be Christ-like. And someone gives you a bad word and you get offended. This, our Lord and Savior was beaten and wrecked. Blood from every part of his blood was pouring from the thorns, from the back, from the sides, bleeding, dying black and blue, not recognizable. And yet he said, Father, forgive them. Ah, can you do that? We, someone says a bad word and we, we, we regurgitate it till kingdom come. And he says, forgive them. And he has nothing. And one's blaspheming him. And he doesn't respond to him. One says to him, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He has nothing. Remember nothing. And from the nothing, he produced paradise from nothing for the thief on his right. And people around was watching in the crowd saying, what's he saying? How can he offer paradise to this thief? He said, nothing praiseworthy. He stole from me. And God's looking in his eyes and says, but you stole from me. And we try to, 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 to define what God can do, what he cannot do. So what, what weighs in the balance? You want the world with all its complication, fakeness, falsehood? The world is fake, superficial. Someone's your friend tomorrow and you don't see them for dust. I promise you the world produce nothing. Put you in great debt and don't pay it for you. I don't help you get through it. But what does God do? He can, he can bring things from nothing into being, praise God. Change your attitude. He may not, the problem may not go, but he'll help you navigate the problem, give you the wisdom to navigate the problem to get to the other side. Amen. That's what God does. And I'm saying to you, trust him who can do more than we can ask or think, praise God. So in the same place, so we have a choice. We stand in the balance here. We stand between two poles. One is we're, the, we're a vessel, we're a vehicle, and we, we, we have the right to choose whatever we want to come into our lives. You've got the right to leave here and go and get takeaway food. You've got the right to go here and make your roast dinner. You've got the right to what you consume in your body is your right. Choose wisely. Choose the nutrition that's edifying and good for you Amen. to strengthen you. To give you clarity of mind. If you eat too many cholesterols, guess what you're going to have? High cholesterol. Too many fats, high cholesterol. If you eat too many sugars, guess what you're going to have? Diabetes, perhaps. Pray you don't. But change your diet. You can change your diet. You can change yourself. Your attitude, your outlook in life. Praise the Lord. So do something proactive in the positive and see the difference it makes. It'll make you happier, joyful. And you'll reach other people. Because if you can do it, people are going to look at you as their example. And their role model. And because if, if John, Smith, Sally, whatever's doing this, I can do it, praise God. And if I can do it, you can do it, praise God. You know, and I always reference my testimony back in the day past. I came out of school, no education. People would say, well, I still think he hasn't got any education, but that's, all right. that's a different story for a different time. Yeah? But what I'm saying is that 
take responsibility. Take the messages, go back home, reflect on them. Importantly, pray to him who can change everything. And that's the Lord of glory. Praise the Lord. I'm going to finish in the next few moments. I'm just going to read just a few more verses. And then we're going to, we're going to uh, come to prayer. And then we're going to have baptisms after, afterwards, just before the communion. Praise God. Psalm 114 verse 2, it says, Judah became his sanctuary and Israel his domain. I pray today that we become, we actually celebrate that we are or becoming or become. His sanctuary makes the difference, changes everything, praise God. I pray that the word will permeate you, will it enrich you, and God will speak to you in the way that you can understand him, praise the Lord. Because he loves you so, so much, praise God. God's love is unfailing. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And whatever's happened yesterday, today, I'm going to tell everyone here, just through the authority of the Holy Spirit, through the authority of the Word of God, I'm saying whatever's happened up to before you came here today is wiped out, and you can move here today renewed, encouraged, blessed, and covered in the love of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Praise the Lord.